everybody for coming. <clears throat> it's been a, a tumultuous year for me. <laughs> We're moving from UT after being there for so many years, but I really appreciate all the hospitality and, and the warmth uh, from the U of H department. But tonight I want to talk about major hydrocarbon plays in the Gulf of Mexico and the Caribbean area, which is the area that we're looking at as part of the consortium that Jack just mentioned. So we had uh, six years of a great consortium at UT, and on the left you see the sponsors of our UT Phase 1 and Phase 2. On the right are our sponsors for phase three, so here at the University of Houston. So there have been a few changes in some of the companies, but the main message I like to give everyone is that our consortium will continue as it, as it has always run, and that we are looking forward to being having a very productive period here at the University of Houston. These companies have committed now for three years uh, for our next funding cycle. <coughs> So I just, I don't want to get too wrapped up with the consortium, but I do want to point out a few people who are here tonight who uh, showed posters earlier. Uh, these are our current students working with the consortium. Uh, Lucia is a master's student here at uh, U of H. You have a poster in the back. Trisha Alvarez is, is a UT student. And she's going to be continuing at UT under our program. Uh, partly because she's finishing up her PhD in December 2012. Right, Tricia? <laughs> uh, Catalina Moreno uh, is a student who we support at University of Stavanger in Norway. We have a partnership with Alejandro Escalon and his group, and Catalina is one of the students working at, at Stavanger. Uh, Javier Sanchez is a uh, PhD student starting here at the University of Houston. He just finished his master's thesis at the University of Texas uh, in the summer. Brendan Figuera is at the University of Stavanger with Alejandro. Rocio is here tonight. She's from the University of Texas, but will be moving to the University of Houston in January to continue her PhD study. Uh, Luis Pachon is uh, a new student, new master's student here at the University of Houston. We just started in August. And then Orieta Mata is a Venezuelan who is uh, well, going to come in January, but had a few problems and will probably show up in the summer. So that's enough for the consortium and the people involved. But I do want to give credit to a lot of those people because the results I'm showing here are not only that group of students, but the students who now finished up at the University of Texas over the past six years. And I'll be pointing out along the way who, who did what work. But some of the main topics that I'm going to talk about here are active versus passive tectonic settings for giant oil fields, mainly in the Latin America region, uh, the economic significance of hydrocarbons in the Gulf of Mexico and South America. I'm going to show you some plate reconstruction of how this whole region fit back together back in the Jurassic time. Uh, how is the Gulf of Mexico passive margin affected by tectonic events that occurred in Mexico? And how has northwestern South America and northeastern South America passive margins been affected by the entry of the Caribbean plate? So these are all questions that are somewhat academic, but all relate to this question of <coughs> where are remain, remaining giant oil fields to be found in this region? So that, that will be sort of the economic uh, consideration of this talk. So first of all, just a few words about giant fields. Uh, giant fields are those which have ultimately recoverable hydrocarbons greater than 500 million barrels of oil or 3 trillion uh, recoverable cubic feet of gas. So that's sort of the definition. Uh, some giants are hybrids based on combined amounts of oil and gas. In 2007, which was the last time that our group compiled giants, there were about 910 worldwide. But now that number has grown to a, a number of over 1,000 in the present day. Uh, 37 giant oil and gas fields were discovered uh, between this period, 1990 and 2000. So that gives you a feel for the rate of discovery of these giants. But the, the big message here, though, is that we're in what we call a cluster of giant fields, both in the Gulf of Mexico and in northern South America. So our 
consortium study area actually covers two clusters in those regions, and uh, that's good news because clusters are places where ideal <coughs> conditions exist for oil and gas. And it's probably going to be areas where we're going to see a lot more giants discovered. So just to sort of put you in a global framework of where these clusters occur, uh, what we did back in 2003 was to classify the giants worldwide based on their tectonic setting. So these blue dots here represent giant oil fields in rift type settings. So this would be the Western Siberian Basin, the North Sea, uh, Northern Africa, uh, some of the Caucasus area. The, this light uh, green color are giant fields in passive margin settings. And this would include the Gulf of Mexico, the uh, Amazon, or the Brazil and Western Africa, the Middle East. The uh, fewer giants here occur in strike zip settings. This would be the Los Angeles Basin area, uh, somewhere in Sumatra. These are areas where strikes at faults really control the, the giants. Uh, red areas are collisional areas. This would be the Permian Basin of West Texas, uh, parts of the uh, Zagros Collisional Belt, the Euro Mountains here. And then finally, these uh, sort of pink dots, which are hard to see, would be what we call uh, giants related to collision of terrain. And that would include northern South America, uh, parts of the uh, Middle East, and, and the uh, Alpine system. So here are all the giants taken together, and uh, the real key here is that most giants of this roughly thousand number group occur either in rift settings or in passive margins. Okay, that's, that's really the take home message about where you find the most giant oil and gas fields. So here's a, a compilation of that, about 35% occur in passive margins, about 30% occur in continental rifts. 19% continental collisional zones, and then on down the list with collision uh, terrain areas, strike slip margins, and subduction margins being the fewest number of, uh, or the, the settings with the fewest number of associated giant fields. So the reason why this is, is occurs is because in order to preserve giant oil and gas fields, you really need to not disrupt the reservoir. And in passive margins and rifts, these are settings where the reservoir tends not to be disturbed by later faulting. Uh, this is a figure from McGregor, 1995, where he shows uh, reserves uh, of oil on this axis and the number of surface shows on this axis. And the key is that the, the largest giants occur in areas where there's the least surface show, so there's been the least disruption to the reservoir. And this just reflects the passive margin and the rifts tend to be in this zone, whereas strike slip, subduction, and other types of margins tend to be in this zone that gets uh, reactivated and therefore does not preserve giants. Okay, so that's sort of a long introduction to this area, but again, we're back to the Gulf of Mexico, the Caribbean, and northern South America. But you can see that the giants here are shown as either. Uh, green stars, which are oil giants, or red stars, which are gas giants. So you can see there's the two big clusters, Gulf of Mexico, which includes the Mexican Gulf of Mexico and the U.S. Gulf of Mexico. But also down here in northern South America, we've got Colombia, Venezuela, Trinidad. And you can see several red and green stars in this area. So here's the second cluster of giant field. So the question is, how can we explain the distribution of not only the giants, but also all of these smaller fields which are taken from the USGS database, which show these you know, two very distinct clusters in the north and in the south, with really not much in between in this, this area of the Caribbean Sea. So one, one explanation for that is what I just mentioned, that in areas of activity where we have continued plate motions, we tend to disrupt reservoirs and make, and make it harder for giants to be preserved. So notice in this region, which was characterized by a lack of, of uh, large oil fields, we have the Caribbean plate. So we have an active area of deformation, which may account for some of the, uh, the 
the reduction in the amount of oil in this region. So, so an important consideration that we need to take into account are the active tectonic controls on how hydrocarbons are distributed. So we have this passive margin setting up here in the Gulf of Mexico, which we know from our study is, is the best environment to preserve giants. Down here we have a nice passive margin along the coast of northeastern South America with very few giants in this region. Uh, we had a, a big wad of giants in this area of Colombia, Venezuela, Trinidad, which is actually an active margin. So, so the rules for where giants occur are a bit complex. And then we have uh, active margin here, a bunch of giants. We have a passive margin here and no giants. So, so it's a complex uh, area that I hope to explain as I go through this talk. So if we look at the gravity field, and this is from the Geosat gravity map, you can see the active Caribbean plate is well outlined here. Notice the big gravity gradients along the plate boundary. This is the Puerto Rico Trench. This is the Eastern Venezuela Basin. These are sites of, of two of the largest uh, gravity minima on the planet, or these two places right here. So this is an area where the plate is pushing its way across the Atlantic Ocean. It's causing this. Atlantic plate to bend down and create this big gravity minimum. Notice over here we have the uh, Middle America Trench, which is a subduction boundary. Here's a strike zip boundary through here. And if we go up into the Gulf of Mexico, you see the gravity field is much more subdued and lacks a lot of these large gradients that we see along the active plate boundary down here in the Caribbean. If we look at the heat flow in this area, the old passive margins, because they're no longer active, tend to be cooler, uh, less heat flow. This would be the Gulf of Mexico up here. This is the Bahama platform. But the more active Caribbean plate areas have these very high areas of heat flow, especially associated with subduction zone. This would be the Lesser Antilles Arc, where the Atlantic crust is subduction beneath the Caribbean plate. Over here, we've got a very young plate. This is the Nazca plate, so it tends to be warmer than these older passive margin plates that are now buried by thick amounts of sediment. So what, what we're doing as part of our project is we're trying to get all of the data from this region into a GIS database. And what I show here are uh, seismic data, these, these red lines, uh, we've compiled seismic out of the literature. Uh, you can see the oil and gas giants on here. Notice that the areas that we, we work on the most are the areas that have these large giant concentrations. And this is partly driven by our sponsors who obviously would like to learn more about the areas where they think they can discover the most oil and gas. Uh, so you can see that our database is very widespread. We go from the Mexican Gulf of Mexico all the way down to this Suriname, Guyana area down in this region. So what is the economic significance of the, uh, this region here, the Gulf of Mexico Caribbean? Here on this global map, we show the giants as red dots. And you can see again the clustering effect. We've got the Gulf of Mexico cluster. Northern South America cluster, the Middle Eastern cluster. So we're in an area of two known clusters. But also we're in an area of a heavy oil belt. This is the Venezuelan heavy oil belt down here. It's not as large as the Canadian heavy oil belt, but it's, it's close. The, uh, the Middle East is shown over here. Conventional reserves in the Middle East, but if you factor in some of these heavy oil belts, you, you actually change the, the overall reserves where now Venezuela is this spike when, it, when you add in the heavy oil belt, whereas with just conventionals, it's down here at number six. So this, this region is also interesting because of some of these non-conventionals, which are so large. The, uh, but the, the real key here, though, for as far as production is that these, these areas form very local markets for North America. In other words, these are all areas where you can easily transport uh, oil and gas back to the North American market rather than bringing oil and gas all the way around from the Middle East. So with that sort of preamble, I'm going to show you some tectonic reconstructions of the Gulf of Mexico Caribbean area, uh, again emphasizing this, this idea of these clusters of giants. Again, 
The colors here represent the, the passive margin giants in Gulf of Mexico. This, uh, these would be the collision related uh, Paleozoic <coughs> giants up in the Permian Basin. The pink color are the terrain accreted giants in Venezuela, Colombia. And, uh, and you will see how this whole area has evolved. Here it is at zero million years, but we're going to start back at 175 million years, which was in the late Jurassic. And you'll see these little colored areas <coughs> jump into view as the giant reservoir is deposited. So you get an idea of when these giant fields appear for the first time. Okay, so here it is, starting 175 million years. This is a little uh, light, but basically this is the outline of North America. This is the Gulf of Mexico. You see about late Jurassic time, this big giant cluster starts to form as a lot of the uh, sources and reservoirs are starting to be deposited in that area. These are already in place. This would be related to the, the earlier collision between North and South America. Uh, this is the Yucatan block. It's rotated out before the Gulf of Mexico. These features out here are going to be part of this Caribbean arc, which you'll see come into this area that's forming as North and South America separate. So we're going to introduce the Caribbean arc into this area. It's going to subduct all the ocean crust that form during the spreading process. So here we are in the sort of mid-Cretaceous time. We opened up this big area here we call the Proto-Caribbean Seaway. This is the Caribbean arc, we call it the Great Arc. That name was actually coined by Kevin Burke. It's called the Great Arc because it's so long. It covers uh, several thousand kilometers if you add up its cumulative length around the Caribbean area today. So the Great Arc is poised here in the Eastern Pacific to enter into this Caribbean region. It's going to subduct all the crust. But important for us in terms of understanding petroleum is what are the tectonic controls of the Great Arc on the petroleum that's going to form here in North and South America? This big gray area is the Caribbean Oceanic Plateau, which acts as the core of the Caribbean Plate. You can see now the Caribbean Plate is moving in. But keep your eye in this area, you'll see the little colored giant dots start to appear in the Eocene, Eocene time as the Great Arc pushes its way across here. It really acts as the main deformation mechanism that forms basins along this area. These are forelimb basins. This will be Maracaibo forming during the Eocene. And now the, the plate is going to push on past, and you'll see eastern Venezuela and Trinidad little dots start to appear there as the plate drives these basins into the uh, oil and gas window. So you can see these giants up here contend to not experience any of this deformation that's associated with the Caribbean plate. So this gets back to the idea that giants prefer areas where they're not undergoing any continuing deformation. So these formed in the late Mesozoic time, and they just sat there while all of this, all these events have been affecting uh, the Caribbean area down in this region. These lines here represent magnetic anomalies. Uh, these, this would be the Eastern Pacific. This white area has all been subducted. These would be the anomalies in the Atlantic Ocean. So this brings us up to the present. So we've got just to review the. Passive margin giants in Gulf of Mexico. No real giants have been discovered down here on the northeastern South America plate. At least, well, there's been a recent discovery in French Guyana that could be a giant. Uh, these are the collision related giants associated with the Caribbean plate. And then not much else in this sort of intervening Caribbean area. <coughs> so I'm going to start out now and, and zoom in a bit on the Gulf of Mexico. And uh, this map here, these white lines represent the different maritime districts in the Gulf of Mexico. So we have Mexico coming out to this area. Uh, there's two uh, joint control zones in the Gulf of Mexico. There's this one here controlled by Mexico and the U.S. And this one here that's jointly controlled by the U.S., Mexico, and Cuba. Cuba has this sort of pie-shaped uh, outline. In this area, they're actually drilling a deep well in the offshore part of Cuba presently. So, again, the oil distribution is very uneven based on past production. You can see that off the coast of Texas, Louisiana, and Mississippi, there's a lot of wells. 
These are the giants with the green uh, stars. But then Florida has never been opened up to production, so you've got a big blank in Florida. Mexico does not have any deep water exploration, so you've got a big blank in Mexico. And notice how these giants in the deep water U.S. part come right up to the border here and stop. So there's a tremendous potential in the offshore Mexico area. So I'm going to go through a, a master's thesis. This was uh, Anthony Rodriguez, who I thought may be here tonight, but perhaps not. But Anthony graduated the University of Texas back in August. He's now with Chevron. And I'm going to show you some uh, maps and, and work done as part of this thesis. Uh, first of all, the, the gravity crustal types in the Gulf of Mexico. Uh, this would be the, uh, we call it the MGOM, Mexican Gulf of Mexico. U.S. GOM. This uh, white outline would be the area thought to be oceanic crust by most people, Dale Burr and others. Right? Uh, these uh, lines represent different boundaries between thick transitional crust and transitional crust. But basically, if you remember from the reconstruction, Yucatan rotated in a clockwise, counterclockwise direction to create this, this gap here. If we look at GPS vectors, we see that the subduction on the Mexican margin is still influencing the uplift of Mexico and the erosion of Mexico into the Gulf of Mexico. These arrows here represent GPS vectors. So as a result of the subduction process, Mexico is getting pushed to the northeast over the Gulf of Mexico. So this is a map showing the distribution of giants. Again, the stars here are the giant fields. And uh, the distribution of salt in the Gulf of Mexico. So you can see there's the uh, Luan canopies up in this region, the Burgos Basin, Tampico area, uh, Veracruz, Campeche Salt Basin here. So you can see there's two big tongues of salt, the northern salt and the southern salt. If you remember from the reconstruction, this is the part that opened up. So if you close this up, these two salts uh, reunite as, as part of one big salt body in this region. And you can see that downslope uh, gravity flowage of salt is occurring in the north and also down here in the, in the Campeche salt basin. But again, notice that the, the deep water exploration in the U.S. GOM stops at the border and all of this uh, wonderful deep water production ends here and it really says uh, it just shows that the, the Mexico deep water has a lot of potential. Uh, the types of passive margin fold belts, that's a term referring to the compressional structures that are formed on the down dip end of these uh, flowing either salt bodies or in this case in the Mexican ridges, these are, this is all sedimentary rocks that are flowing down the slope. So we're actually creating fold belts by gravitational movement of these areas down slope. So what, what did we do or what did Anthony do as part of his thesis that was an original uh, mapping product? Well, UT, UT had some old data collected back in the 1970s which extends into Mexico. Uh, the UT uh, DBDS uh, project with Bill Galloway and others has been working in the U.S. Gulf of Mexico for many years. So the idea was to, to map this part of the Mexican GOM and actually try to correlate over into the U.S. GOM, which they've been working on for the past, I think, 13 years. So these are some of the long transects that Anthony put together as part of his thesis. We also compiled, uh, there's been a fair amount of recently published data from Mexico these colored lines here, uh, we actually got out of the literature scan and then converted to seg Y. So this could all be worked on as part of in a, in a workstation environment. So again, the stratigraphy, uh, we've got the Cenozoic stratigraphy of the U.S. column, which is basically this column. And this column would be the uh, Mexican stratigraphy taken off those older lines. And you can see that it's it's a flat bottom basin with a, with a very horizontal fill, so correlation is not difficult in the Gulf of Mexico basin. That's a little hard to see, but we took wells from uh, all around the basin and attempted to correlate the different seismic units. And you can see basically a very thick wedges over here by Mexico. You can see a thick wedge coming out of the Mississippi fan. 
And then over in the southeastern Gulf, everything thins up because these are all carbonate environments, which have a, a much thinner uh, trade still. So here's an example of one of the sort of we call them mega transects going from uh, eastern Mexico all the way back almost to the Florida escarpment. You can see the a uh, couple of things that are interesting. A large fan-shaped body coming out here showing yellow, which thins out to the to the east. Uh, this is what we call the Laramide fan. It's uh, mainly a Paleogene Eocene age. So it's coming off of Mexico, and we uh, think that it accompanied the Laramide orogeny. There's some salt out in the middle of the basin, which is this purple color here. Uh, and then you see the Mississippi fan over as you come across towards Florida. It's this feature here. Uh, the Mexican ridges are part of are one of these what we call passive margin pole belts. You can see how material is slumping down off of eastern Mexico. Notice the folding out here, uh, thrust faulting, uh, very uh, high amplitude folds if you go upslope. And then eventually you see big normal fault scarps up here along the coastal area of Mexico. So basically <coughs> this is a big gravitational slump with extensional features up high and the uh, compressional features down low. Here's just a zoom showing this is the normal fault you see along the coast of Mexico. These are the detachment horizons which are penetrating down into the basin. You can see the compressional features which are called the Mexican ridges or, or folds in this area. But the growth fault is mainly post middle Miocene, and that's really the onset of this uh, Mexican ridges fold belt. There's two detachments, one in the Oligocene and one in the middle, Miocene, middle Eocene stratigraphy. Uh, so a, a very uh, standard attachment compression for the toe. But this is a feature that has a lot of interest for the oil industry. This what we call the Laramide Age fan. It's this colored region here. It's about almost four kilometers thick. Uh, it covers 500 kilometers. It goes out into the Gulf of Mexico basin. It's sourced from the Sierra Madre Oriental, which is the thrust belt in eastern Mexico. You see a slight wedge thinning from southwest to northeast. But the reason it's important is this is all sand, or we, we infer that this is mainly sand. It's a proximal sand, so it may have a, a good porosity permeability, uh, and it has never been drilled as far as we know. Uh, the, the basic uh, substance periods in the Gulf of Mexico though, can be seen on these substance plots taken both from the U.S. and the Mexican Gulf. But basically you have a, a rifting event up here at the top in the late Mesozoic, passive margin forming. These little uh, bumps here, these little gradients represent the quickening. This would be the Laramide time when the fan was forming, probably related to thrusting in Mexico. And then a very steep substance up to the present day. So these are how we sort of subdivided the, the uh, stratigraphy of Mexico into these distinct uh, sequences. So using that information, uh, Anthony mapped out the passive margin one tectonic sequence. So this would be mainly in the lower Cretaceous period. Uh, you can see that the purple colors here are the deeps, and the uh, warmer colors are the highs. So we have a large shallow carbonate ramp. A sediment, not much sediment coming in from anywhere. This is mainly a carbonate environment. If you look at the uh, isochron, top Jurassic to top Cretaceous, it's pretty flat uh, with possible a little bit of rift in this area. So not much sediment coming into the carbonate system. But during the Laramide, things change abruptly where uh, we go from, this would be the top Cretaceous structure map. You can see this high along the eastern coast of Mexico. This would be the leading edge of the Laramide Cold Trust Belt in Mexico. This is Chicxulub, the crater affecting the uh, large shallow carbonate ramp of the Yucatan Peninsula. But notice the isochron from top Cretaceous, top using is this large body here, which we infer mainly to be sand, coming off the Laramide orogeny of uh, eastern Mexico. You can see it's very extensive. It does receive a little bit of sediment from the U.S. GOM, but most of the sediment is proximal coming from Mexico. Uh, we have a second phase of Casa Margin, we call Casa Margin number two. That's post Laramide orogeny when things sort of settle down. Here we see the Rio Grande Delta Fed apron coming out of the border area. 
and not much else really happening in, in this time period. And then finally, in the Miocene, the recent time, we see the, uh, the beginning of normal faults along the Mexican ridges. And this is probably related to collapse of the margin as this gets over Stephen, possibly as a result of the uh, Laramide event, which is really steeping up this part of the Gulf of Mexico slope. So this is collapsing. We form the Mexican ridges. Uh, here you see the Mississippi fan is starting to be uh, apparent, starting the late Miocene. So what does the Laramide fan mean for Mexico? Well, we have a, a very large uh, sandstone fan, which is this feature here, which is loading up the older Jurassic and early Cretaceous source rocks. So you, you could have pushed this area into the oil and gas windows, updip migration into the anticline of the Mexican ridges. Uh, so this is basically the play where uh, oil is migrating up into these large anaclines. It's very similar to what we have in Perdido and, and parts of the U.S. Um, and just a, a quick note, Bill Galloway put together all these really nice maps showing the paleogeography of the U.S. part of the Gong. And this would be Upper Wilcox Island, which is in the Eocene. You can see the Wilcox is a sandy unit which represents the drainage of the sort of central and western part of the USA. But this work that we've done shows that a more significant source of sand that's more proximal is this Laramide orogeny, which really isn't felt that much in the US Gong. So we could have a different system operating here than we see in the US part of the Mexico. Okay, so uh, what I'd like to do now is finish up on northern South America. And again, this is Colombia, Venezuela, Guyana, Suriname, French Guyana, and Brazil. And again, these are the giant fields, the big cluster area in this region. The, uh, the, the real question here, though, is, you know, we've talked about passive margins in the Gulf of Mexico. And, and there are some people that think this is more or less a passive margin. Uh, we know that we can put South America back along these flow lines to this position. So Colombia is up here in Texas. Uh, this part of Brazil is up here and then along the Florida uh, margin here. So we know all this goes back together. So the question is, how significant is the passive margin phase of this reconstruction versus the active margin phase associated with the Caribbean plate? So you know, if you look at the Caribbean plate from the east, you can see this. You know, here we're looking across Barbados, the Lesser Antilles, Venezuela, Colombia. You can see this. This looks like a large bulldozer effect where the plate is pushing out towards you. It's pushing this large wedge of sediment in front of it, just as a bulldozer would be pushing sediment in front of it. So, our preferred model is. Uh, this sort of bulldozer idea where the Caribbean plate has moved in and it's basically bulldozed all the passive margin material in front of it as the plate has moved to the east. These numbers here represent the position of the Caribbean plate through time starting in late Cretaceous, Eocene, Ligocene, Miocene, Pliocene, Pleistocene. So it's basically moved across this area, sort of pushing, pushing in front of it all the passive margin sediments that existed there previous to the Caribbean flood. So now I'll just show you some data we have from the area which we think verifies this, this passive, uh, this bulldozer model. Uh, starting out with the, I'll show you some of the Bolivar data which we collected back in 2005. Uh, these are some older NSF data that we also use. But basically, if we look at this gravity map of Venezuela and part of Trinidad, you can see here's the, the core of the Caribbean plate. This is the Caribbean Oceanic Plateau formed about 88 million years ago. If you remember from the reconstruction, this would have been that dark gray area. Uh, this feature here is what Captain Burke calls the Great Arc. Uh, some people call it the ABC Ridge, Aruba, Bonaire, and Curacao Ridge. This is the Aves Ridge. So this is the feature that was in the leading edge of the Caribbean plate as it pushed to the east. Uh, these blue areas are the accretionary prisms, which are, are later features uh, formed uh, during some thrusting between the, the Great Arc and the, the Oceanic Plateau. Uh, this feature is the Granada 
uh, Bonaire Falcon Basin, which we can treat as a single basin, although it, it does change a lot in its width along the strike. And then this is the South American Pass of Margin. So basically, this is the old South American continent. And all of this material here was created up against the old South American continent as the Caribbean plate pushed to the east. So right now, if, if we just look at the active tectonics of northern South America, it's an, it's an active collisional boundary over here related to the Panama Mar collision. We have an active strike set boundary along the Pokemon El Pilar fault zone. And then we have a subduction boundary uh, along the Barbados uh, appreciating prison. Trisha Alvarez has a poster over here on this, this part of the plate boundary. So if we look at the gravity map, you can see a lot of these continuous trends associated with the great arc. This would be the Aves Ridge, the ABC Ridge, it kind of wraps around this way. We think it goes all the way down to Peru and Ecuador. This would be the, the Lesser Antilles Arc. This actually broke off from the old uh, Aves Ridge back in the early tertiary as it migrated more to the east. So we have good continuity of these collided terrains across the whole region. Uh, one of the things that we work on in the project is improving the depth of basement map of the area. These colors here represent deep basement, which is the blue, bluish colors, the red and yellow represent shallow basement. You can see here's the strike sit, the present day strike sit boundary. Here are these large sort of uh, down warped parts of the craton, which were overthrust by the Caribbean arc as it came in. This would be the Lesser Antilles arc, this is the Aves ABC arc. You can see all these features are apparent on different types of data. Uh, they're all consistent with this eastward moving Caribbean bulldozer. So here is some data though just showing what the gray arc looks like in cross section. It's basically this large brown uh, feature here. Uh, so if we cross it uh, over in the far east, this would be this line here. You can see it there, there it is on this line, here it is here. So it's a very continuous feature going all the way across the Northern Caribbean. It gets problematic over in Colombia where it's covered by a lot of sediment. Uh, Rocio uh, Bernal is working on this area to try to see if the Great Arc actually goes under the lower Magdalena Basin in this region. But if you look at the velocity of the Great Arc, it's very similar to other arcs like the Aleutians, the Sierra Nevada Bathala. So this is a these velocities are all consistent with this forming as an intra-oceanic island arc. So what, what are the consequences though of the collision of this arc with the northern part of South America in this time transgressive mode? If this model is correct, we should see older basins forming to the west, followed by progressively younger basins going to the east. And that's what we see. We see the Mar Kaiba forming in the late Paleocene, Eocene. We see the Eastern Venezuela forming the Ligocene, Miocene. And then we see the Columbus forming in the Playa Pleistocene. So the model works very well to explain the distribution of Forlan basins, not only down here, but also up in Guatemala and the Cuba, Hispaniola area. So the Forlan basin is really the key element of the petroleum system in this area. It's basically a large asymmetrical basin bounded on one side by this thrust and then the uh, other side is bounded by this large dam warp of craton and the fill is this large triangular red area. So here's the Maracaibo. Uh, this is the line sort of going north south. You can see this light blue unit this is before the basin more back in the Paleocene Eocene when the, when the leading edge of the Caribbean plate was just in this part in here. This is a very oil rich area. Uh, these are high, very high quality reservoir rocks. Uh, most of the oils trap below what we call the Eocene conformity, which is this feature here. Uh, some of the oil plays in Maracaibo, again, you see most of the oils associated with the big unconformity in the Eocene, but some of it does escape up into the Miocene younger section. So what about the area of eastern Venezuela? Here uh, we have a refraction line across here which shows that the present day strike <coughs> boundary is the site of the former suture between the Great Arc, which is all this material to the north, and the continent, which is all this material to the south. 
So again, we have a four-limb basin set up here where the oil is being expelled out of the collision zone and up into the four-limb basin in this area. What about Trinidad? Well, Trinidad is the, the most recent event that's affected the Caribbean play as it's moved across. Again, most of this is ply Pleistocene in age. So you've got the Columbus Basin down here. These refraction data show the leading edge of the Caribbean plate, which is roughly in this area, as it's pushing the Columbus Basin down in front of it as the whole plate moves eastward. So it's the same process as the Maracaibo and the Eastern Venezuelan Basin, which is happening more recently. So the same tectonic process. Uh, but I guess the, the big point here, though, is that we can clearly see the suture between the continent, which is this area, a very thick crust and about 45 kilometers, and this great arc feature, which is a much thinner piece of crust and about 30 kilometers. And that suture is that big bright spot right here, which is the LPR fault. So the modern fault has now uh, taken over from that previous suture. There's just a little diagram showing the suture zone, the great arc, and the continent. So what about the oil in eastern Venezuela? Well, this, this collision between the Caribbean plate and the craton expel oil into several different types of reservoirs. We have the 40 al type, which are the deep ones, out here in the deep part of the eastern Venezuela basin. We've got the officina as the oil started to move up dip, roughly in this area. And then we have the heavy oil belt out near the Orinoco River. So light oil, progressively heavy oil, and then very heavy oil up in the Orinoco belt. So here's the L40 all type, uh, sort of a fault and fold, big anticline, light oil in the core. Uh, here's the officina where the oil is moving through the system, moving up dips. So these would be oligocene, modocene sediments with reservoirs at various levels. A uh, little bit of normal faulting uh, towards the edge of the Orinoco Delta as material sort of collapses off towards the east into the Trinidad area. Here we get some growth fault, which also act as structural traps in this area. And then the heavy oil belt, this is a very thin uh, amount of sediment in the Miocene and younger age. But this is where the heavy oil belt, heavy oil has ended up after it's moved all the way up dip from the, uh, the deep you know, Fortial area. So the uh, deep basin is here, heavy oil moves up here. You can see the different grades of the heavy oil going from 20 to 6 API. But this big red arrow represents its path from the deep basin. Uh, then just a, a quick word about the Caribbean plate. All of that, what I just showed you, was on the continental part of South America. But remember, we're starting to find oil and gas out on the Caribbean plate. So this is a completely different hydrocarbon system than this continental system. So here we have the Carapano Basin, which is uh, also known as the Granada Basin, between the Lesser Antilles and the Tobago Ridge. These gray areas represent gas fields that are, are part of the North Coast Marine Area. We think that some of the gas is uh, moving up dip from the deeper part of the Carapano Basin into these traps here. So this is a different, completely different system than we see to the south. So without a tectonic framework, uh, this distribution of hydrocarbons is complex and confusing. So we've got all this oil, all this seeps, and all this stuff everywhere. But without the understanding of the Caribbean plate, the Great Arc, the Foreland Basin history, the West-East migration, it all looks pretty complicated. So I think our project has, has done a good job, I think, in really trying to explain what's going on in this region. So the future, uh, well, it doesn't take a genius to figure this out. I mean, Florida, you know, is, a, is obviously a prime area. This is mainly a carbonate environment. Uh, deep water Mexico, another prime area. Yucatan is another carbonate environment. So you can see the Gulf of Mexico is actually very poorly covered in terms of uh, where the drilling has occurred. Cuba is now testing this, this region in here. Uh, if we go down to northern South America, these are all the Forland Basin, these, these in here. The Forland Basin stops here. So you need a new idea out in this region, and this would be back into the passive margin geology. 
Uh, there was a big discovery recently in French Guyana, which is a basically passive origin Cretaceous turbidite clay. Uh, Tola Oil and others have, have sort of broadcast this as a possible clay that could exist all up and down this northeastern South America. So that that's another big future area. Uh, the Portland Basin, though, has a lot of things that could be done in this region. Uh, Luis Pachon is working on the Pucamaya down here in southern Colombia. You have a couple of students working in the Llanos Basin. So there's a lot of, lot of future uh, work to be done here. So I think I'll end that there and welcome any questions. <laughs>